Good afternoon and welcome to our fifth episode in our Marketing Rebels series. Um, I'm really excited this afternoon to have Carla Rubishaw from Turtle talking to me. Carla heads up the marketing at Turtle. Um, and actually today I, when I was looking on LinkedIn, I saw this great quote about Turtle um, and what you guys do. And it said, it's a mix of behavioral science to content marketing. So um, I guess to kick us off, it'd be really nice, Carla, because we're going to dig into the topic of this specific episode is all about stock gating content. It doesn't work. And I think we don't normally do this, but actually Turtle and what they do is really relevant here. So it'd be great if you could just give everyone listening a bit more of a, an introduction into Turtle and what they do. And also, yeah, welcome. Yeah, thank you very much, Alice. It's really nice to be here. And yeah, absolutely happy to just provide a quick overview of Turtle. So essentially what Turtle is, is um, it's a platform that enables you to be able to build better relationships um, with your contacts through really beautiful, interactive and effective content. And uh, it's essentially we are kind of an alternative to the more traditional ways of publishing content like the PDF for instance. So, um, you know, I'm sure many people who are watching this probably know this, but it is a really old fashioned way to publish content, the PDF. I mean, it was invented in 1993. And the fact that we're still using it today to publish our content online, um, you know, in the 21st century, uh, it's, it's a little bit concerning, really, because it's not really optimized for, um, you know, pleasant reading experience. The human brain does not gel well with reading a PDF for a huge amount of reasons. And really what Turtle is trying to do is to offer that reading experience that pleases the human brain. So it's actually designed to be far more compelling and engaging, helps you to, you know, read for longer, remember more of what you've read. And ultimately as marketers, that's what we're trying to get our readers to do, to and you know really stick with us and to have that really great uh, reading experience. So that's essentially what Turtle is. It kind of offers this, this premium experience. Um, it's super interactive. Uh, one of the really neat features that we're actually about to launch next week is this whole personalization suite of capabilities so you're able to personalize your content like basically at the click of a button so if you have like i don't know a thousand people you were going to email and um, you might want each of them to receive a, a slightly different version of your content and um, you can do that through turtle and then the, the beauty is you can actually measure to see exactly how people are reading it so you can see which bits they read which bits they don't read and that ultimately helps you to optimize the content you send in the future so that you're only producing things people actually want to read. Amazing, thanks Carla. And the reason why I think it's important and we don't normally obviously talk about the products um, that, you know, of the people we're interviewing because we want, don't want this to be a sell in any way. I think it's just important because we're gonna be talking about this whole topic of gate stopping to gate content. And both you and I work for staff, high growth businesses and companies, and there's still obviously a need and, um, an emphasis on us generating demand um, mm. for for the business and for sales and so I think what um, Turtle offers is probably that um, balance between both that that need and then also ensuring that you're engaging people with content in the best way possible mm -hmm. um, but we're going to dive into this more so because I'm really interested in it and honestly if I if I'm honest and and I think anyone who signed up to this webinar has actually seen it in action in at, at Mailtastic and at Cognizant we do gate content and we do see a lot of success um with that and it's actually one of the key channels that we've scaled um and we have a whole role in the sales team built out around this process called the marketing development rep um but I'm also really interested in in all the things that you do Carla and the mm -hmm. other side of that story and how maybe you know, it can meet in the middle somewhere so um Let's dive in. Um, could you start by outlining where you kind of, you sit on this point in general? Um, is it never? Is it sometimes? Is it always? Yeah, I mean, I think it's 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 definitely sometimes, right? There are times where it makes sense to gate content, and there are times where it makes absolutely no sense to gate content. And I really think when you're thinking about whether or not to gate content. It should be very much based on what kind of content you're you're distributing, uh, who the audience is, where they're at in terms of their buyer journey. So if you keep those things in mind, then um, I think it starts to become clearer as to when you should and shouldn't get content. 
Um, but I definitely think that the tolerance level for gating content these days has, you know, reduced significantly. And, um, you know, if you think back to, gosh, you know, six, seven years ago, it was totally normal that everything would be gated. But uh, I, I think nowadays, you know, you really do have to pick and choose when is the right time. Yeah, I think I, I do agree definitely there. Um, and on that point, how do you balance the need to deliver like a certain volume of MQLs or I don't know if it's SQLs or, you know, whatever your sort of sales delivery metric is into the business um, with this approach? And is it an either or, or can, like, have you found that the perfect balance? I mean, I think you, it's always a balancing act, right? Um, I guess one of my bugbears with many marketers out there, and not necessarily even them, more so the targets that are set for them, is that there is this obsession with delivering a quantity of leads. And so marketers get super focused on delivering quantity over quality. And actually quality is what should really count because anybody can generate thousands and thousands of leads, but if they are not your target market, you know, they're not in market right now, they've shown zero intent, you know, whatever it might be that you need in order to be able to determine whether this lead is good or bad, like it's, it's pointless, you know, the sale, you're just gonna frustrate your sales team because they will be like this marketing just deliver us rubbish leads. So we're not gonna spend the time to follow up and then they'll might actually miss the good leads. So what we need to get better at is actually delivering better quality leads. And um, there was like a really interesting LinkedIn survey that was done, um, I think not that long ago, it was like a B2B buyer survey. And they were actually analyzing how generations are getting savvier when it comes to gated content. And so the younger the generations are, the more likely they are to actually put false information into these gates. So unless you are delivering something like a serious value, a lot of the time people, if you're gating your content, either it's gonna cause people to bounce off and they're not going to, you know, progress through, or if they, you know, they want the content, but they just don't feel like you're deserving of their information, then they'll just put phony details. And that is of no use to anybody. So I think you do need to kind of consider other ways to be able to get people to sort of raise their hand and think about, you know, how can you deliver the most value to your readers so that they will eventually give their information to you willingly. Um, so, yeah, I think that um, we just need to focus more on that quality side of things. Definitely. And actually, when I was thinking about this as well, um, we, we had a big brainstorming session as a marketing team just yesterday, kind of on this topic, because one thing that we do and we believe really strongly in is that we only ever build quality content that's super actionable. But actually, it's all hiding behind a gate a lot of the time. And so we're mm. reliant on the messaging in an ad or the um, so to, to, you know, to actually show them enough value for someone to feel like they want to give us their details. And all, but we mm. haven't actually shown really like we try like we have quite lots of creative ways of, of you know, developing these ads and we use infographics and things to really show that like, this is going to be super valuable to you. We have, I think, quite good landing pages for that purpose as well. But what we don't really do is get we don't sort of tease forward the value that someone's going to get by reading this piece and we're missing a trick there definitely and we were sort of talking and brainstorming around you know do we actually um create snippet videos where we talk to some of the key points within this white paper or this ebook that they're mm -hmm. going to um actually experience and just start you know being less afraid of giving away some of our great resources without gating it. And I think that's kind of a fear factor that we have to, and we need to balance it still with a lead number in mind. But um, yeah, so we, I think we're definitely on board with a lot of what you said and we're thinking about our strategy as well. So it's really Yeah, I, I mean, I think they're, one of the things I guess with Turtle, which is really nice is it does give you the options in terms of how you get content. So um, I definitely can totally empathize with what you're saying. And I've been there in the past when I didn't have technology like Turtle um, at hand. And it's thinking about creative ways to be able to, yeah, de um, demonstrate the value upfront. 
And um, one of the really great things about Turtle is that you can choose the type of gating you want. So there is the hard upfront gate, which is typical of PDF downloads. Um, we don't tend to use that at Turtle because it's just everything I've said, it, it basically creates a barrier before anyone's even been provided any value. And so, uh, and, and the other challenge with that is that if somebody does fill in that hard gate up front, they may get to the content and realize, oh, this isn't actually what I thought it was. And then they just don't bother reading the rest. And so again, it's like another lead that you're passing to sales where actually it's probably junk for them because this person isn't actually interested in whatever it is you wanna to speak to them about. So other ways that you can do it um, with our technology is um, you can do like a midway gate. So for instance, we did a piece of research last year with Forrester, which cost us a lot of money to do. And we obviously wants to get um, you know, value out of it on the other side. So we did want to gate the content, but we just didn't want to gate it immediately. So you actually get through a couple of chapters of the report first before it asks you for your information. So you've already kind of seen a little bit. You kind of know, yes, this is relevant. And it's at that point that the gate pops up and says, hey, you know, if you want to carry on reading, we just need a few bits of information from you. And the great thing about that is if the person genuinely is interested, then they'll happily give you their information. And if they're not, then they'll bounce off. And that's fine because we probably don't want to be speaking to them anyway. So that works quite well. And the other thing that we offer is dismissible gates. So these are ones where it's totally optional. So it can pop up and say, hey, you know, um, you know, fancy signing up to this newsletter or, you know, something else. Um, you know, a webinar or whatever you're trying to kind of get them to sign up to. And if they don't feel like doing it, they just X out and they carry on with their reading experience. But, you know, again, if they're having a really positive reading experience and they feel like what you're delivering is valuable, then they'll be much more likely to actually fill in that gate. So there are other ways of doing it um, that doesn't require them to sign away their life before they've even accessed your content. Definitely, yeah. And I think that's really interesting. And, and one thing we've been trying actually as well is um, breaking up the big ebook into small bite sized um, chunks and chapters, mm -hmm. I suppose. And then providing some of those, you know, ungated. But then to, if you want to read, if you want to go on and continue the series, then that would be when you, know, you would have to fill in your details to, mm -hmm. to get the rest of that information, which is also working really well. So, We've also got a great yeah. question come in um, uh, for you, Carla, which is what, what is your approach to deciding when to gate? Do you produce the content and then decide or do you decide whether the content will be gated first and then write it accordingly? So I guess with the Forrester piece, that was sort of I guess, one very specific example. But mm -hmm. um, in general, um, for your content strategy, what would be your approach there? I think generally speaking, we know before we produce it whether or not it's going to be gate worthy because Typically, the content that we produce, uh, you know, it's it's being produced with a particular stage of the buyer journey in mind. And I personally think that the content that um, you get generally should not be top of funnel stuff because top of funnel is really enabling people to familiarize themselves with your brand and, you know, everything that is you. And if you gate that experience up front, then they're, you know, more than likely never going to find out about you. So you've got to make it as easy as possible for these people to start to build some familiarity with you. And like if it results in giving some content away, you know, getting them onto your website, well, then that opens up opportunities for you to be able to retarget them down the line and eventually nurture them to the point that they will willingly give your information, uh, give, give you their information. Um, so I generally think that it's more middle of funnel content that you start to gate because that's where these people are already familiar with your brand. They already know that you offer something valuable and then they're going to be more likely to think, OK, you know, these these guys aren't complete strangers to me. I've already had a bit of value from them. Now I might be ready to actually, um, you know, provide some information. So whether that be a webinar or whether that be um, you know, some primary research or something that is like high value. I think the key always is it needs to be something original. It needs to be something where they cannot find this information somewhere else. So if you can tick those boxes, 
then I think you're totally justified um, gating. But I would caution that, you know, don't ask for too much too soon because um, that can be really off-putting if you have like this long form with 10 different questions and you want to know your birth date and you know all of these things it just it it becomes too much and you think well, why do you need so much information from me I'm only trying to you know access a white paper or whatever like you don't need all this information and oftentimes businesses don't actually need all that from information they're not actually using that information properly so like don't ask for it if you're not going to use it so um, yeah, that's generally how I approach when and when not to gain. And that actually takes us on really nicely to the next um, point that I wanted to talk about, which is how do you manage the point of personalization? So, you know, you're talking about actually the turtle has this kind of built-in functionality, but sometimes in order to be able to personalize to a meaningful extent, we need to progressively profile um, our, our audience and forms enables us to do this, this better, mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of the time. So I, I guess when you are looking at the personalization experience, how are you ensuring that you do gather the right amount of information on your audience in order to deliver that truly personalized piece of content? For sure. Yeah, I mean, I think to your point, progressive profiling is, is a good way to do that where you over time are asking them other bits of information about, about them. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think it's the key is probably to do it in a way where it's not like a mandatory thing. You know, you're not forcing them every time they want to access the next piece of content to fill in a form because that's going to be super off putting. You'd be like, well, these guys should already know who I am. Why am I being asked for all this additional information? But if you kind of position it in a way that's like, hey, you know, could you just let us know about this because we want to personalize your experience and give you, you know, more satisfying experience. Um, but it's optional, then people might do it because, you know, you're not forcing their hand in order to access your content. So I think that's that's a totally um, reasonable way of approaching things. But the other thing I would say is don't get too caught up on, um, you know, data that people have to give you. Like, we should also get better at just taking note of behavioral data as well and like actually listening to what our audience are doing and saying and you know there's a lot of things which are unspoken that actually can really help us to shape their experiences in the future and again this is one of the things that we love about turtle but it don't need turtle in order to do this is to actually see you know what are these people reading so whether it's a blog post that you have on your site and you can see that this contact has been reading this blog post for this amount of time like that's really valuable information because you then know okay this contact is really interested in this topic so we should probably send them an email with this white paper that we've recently done on that topic or invite them to this webinar that we're going to be hosting on this topic and so you can make your content a lot more relevant just by paying attention to what people are reading and how they're engaging with different things. So um, I think there are different ways of personalizing the experience and it, yeah, it doesn't always have to be demanding more information from people. Yeah, I think that's a really valid point, definitely. And so um, this takes me on to the next question, which is it would be great to understand, you know, at Turtle when you, you know, we're setting out into a new quarter now, um, I don't know if you plan on a quarterly basis or a half yearly basis or a monthly basis, but um, what's your approach to content marketing at Turtle, like broad, broad top level overview? Gosh, if you don't how, mind long, how long do yeah, you have? Say, if you don't mind sharing, but sort of how would you, how do you kind of break it down? I mean, so another question we had was, for example, like how much percentage of the content do you plan to have gated um, versus not? And um, mm -hmm. how do you set out what topics you're going to be talking about in the next coming quarter? Um, mm -hmm. and how they're going to, you know, filter into different campaigns. Yeah, so, I mean, I guess from like a topic perspective, we we have to do a few things. One is obviously looking at our business and where we want to go with our business. So um, we need to make sure that the topics that we're covering are, you know, closely aligned to our value proposition and, you know, just making sure that the things we're discussing are super relevant. And there's been like some learnings for us this year, I think, where we've done some webinars which were um, super interesting to marketers, but not really that closely aligned to what we can offer and the value we can deliver. 
and so that offered a bit of a jarring experience you know where like particularly for our um our sdr team who are trying to get in touch with people and like they're trying to make that connection between the topic that these people were um you know for the webinar or whatever that they joined and like what we can offer them mm -hmm. and so what we quickly learned was like as interesting as those other topics are there's really not much value in us discussing those if we cannot align it back to what we're doing so now we are way more focused on um, producing content and you know whether it's uh, reports guides blog posts webinars whatever it might be it's all geared around things that we feel we can tie back to how we can help people so you know whether it's personalization whether it's account-based marketing sales enablement all of these things we know our SDR person would be able to call somebody on the phone and have a really good conversation around hey you joined that webinar uh, last Thursday um, clearly you're interested in account-based marketing and um, as a matter of fact you know we produced this ABM guide and it shows you know how to do blah 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 and actually you know, Turtle can really help you with that as well. Is that a big priority for you as a business? So, you know, really, really thinking about what are the kind of main talking points that we want as a business and then aligning those um, those topics around that, but also not forgetting what people, like I mentioned earlier, are actually saying back to us, you know, monitoring that behavioral data, seeing what are the areas that people are interested in. Like if we produce a guide and we see actually everybody is spending um, you know, the majority of their time reading the chapter on account-based marketing, then that suggests to us that we should be doing more content around ABM because that's what people are asking for. So I think that's generally how we go about, um, you know, figuring out what topics we want to produce and then, you know, deciding the best way to execute on that. So we typically will um, have like a blog post a week go out. Um, we'll generally have about one guide a month that we're launching, um, not always, but roughly speaking. Um, and then we will, you know, just decide the best ways to distribute that content. And um, I think in terms of the question around gating and how much of our stuff is gated, I'd say very, very little. The, the main thing we gate is the webinars that we do. Um, but in terms of other content, it's normally the dismissible gates that I mentioned earlier, where you know you'll have like a pop up saying, "Hey, you know, sign up to one of our newsletters," and, and those are really successful. We see like tons and tons of sign ups to our newsletter um, through uh, content that we are distributing. But um, yeah, we we don't tend to gate very much at all because we do believe that there's more value to be gained for us as a business in just creating that brand awareness. And um, you know, eventually, when people are ready, they'll raise their hand, you know, and um, they'll they'll tell us that it's it's time to um, for us to you know pick up the phone and give them a call. So yeah, I don't really know if that like answered your question, Alice. Yeah, if you yeah. have more specific questions around it, obviously, I'm happy to answer. No, that's great. Thank you. And actually, we've had like another question in for you, which is um, basically, if you're going to gate content, so later in the funnel, which types do you find to get the most valuable leads? Is it success stories, white papers, anything that stands out as a real winner for moving people through the funnel? Mm -hmm. This is really interesting. And I mean, I could talk a little bit about what we our success as well that we've seen on this. And it's definitely tied to really understanding who buys from you and what their pain points are and then creating content which literally speaks so closely aligned to those pain points that when someone reads it by the end of it you've told the story that they're like oh my gosh absolutely that's a no-brainer type you know i need to find out more i need to actually go on a demo here um, and see this product for myself or see how someone could solve these pains for me so from our and sometimes that's looked like um we've done things like a business case proposal um we've done things like you know a, re a return on investment um sort of one page of document and these types of things where we try and just really um in detail go into the, the specific pain points that we know some of our customers or prospects are facing uh i don't know if you want to also yeah give your thoughts on that too what's worked for yeah. Turtle. No, I totally agree with everything you said there. Um, I think that that is exactly the way we do it as well. And uh, yeah, you know, as I say, I think 
you just need to make sure that whatever you are you know you you are gating um it just has to be of super high value you know if you know i would not be recommending um gating anything like blog posts or infographics or videos or anything like that it's just not going to work and um, case studies you shouldn't should never be um gating you know I, I think generally speaking the types of content that work well are you know original content that um you know where there's research where there's something really practical like i find guides normally are quite good pieces of content to um to gate because you're offering something like super practical like a step-by-step -step on how to do something like that's that's something people will potentially give you their information for because it's like this is something i can actually um use to deliver value within my own business so um yeah i you know it's the kind of thing where like for instance and i know we've spoken about this before alice and i think you guys have um, launched something similar is um this uh email course so it's like a we call it 30 days to better content and it's like a e-course that we offer totally for free and it's something where the content in it is really good and actually businesses will often pay for this sort of stuff you know and we're offering it totally for free the only thing is people need to obviously give us their email address and and that's it you know and um, so I think it's it's stuff like that where it's like this is like super valuable and I can't believe they're actually offering this for free because there are businesses out there that will make money from it. That's the kind of stuff where I would seriously recommend getting. Yeah, no, I think that's really helpful. And one thing I was going to say also back on the point of when you're deciding about what content to write and whether mm -hmm. it's going to and then also what to gate and if it's going to help you I guess move sales further along in the funnel one thing that we've now taken on as a marketing team to keep us really true to this is we take on the task of providing our what we call the marketing development reps but with a brief pitch of so if we're going to gate something and they're going to be following up on these leads this is how you tie it back to what we offer and that's how we would see that conversation going mm -hmm. so we're making ourselves think about that at the beginning stage before we write the content to kind of keep ourselves true to it um and then we actually also write the cadence for the marketing development reps as well so again because we want to make sure that we and we'll provide in that cadence lots of ungated content around a similar topic um also some that's not branded so we, we like to send people off to things that aren't our isn't our own content but that we've read mm -hmm. and feel is really valuable and useful as well um so some of those things can help you work out um what sort of gated content you should be producing that is going to help you push people further through the funnel and help your sales teams have better conversations yeah totally amazing um so one thing i think would be really what i'd love to hear about is could you talk us through your most successful campaign which involved ungated content just to kind of understand in very practical steps what that looked like mm. Yeah, sure, no worries. Um, so I did um, have a think about this prior to uh, joining and I asked my team, what do you think is um, the most successful campaign? Because their success can mean so many things depending on what you actually set out to achieve in the first place. And um, I'm not sure if this is our most successful, but it's probably one of the more fun ones. So I thought I would talk about this one. And it was um, a piece of content that we produced I guess maybe we launched it, I want to say like May time, something like that. It was right in the middle of when everybody was stuck at home during lockdown. And we decided what would be a really, really fun, uplifting piece of content to send to people would be kind of like, I don't know if you know these like choose your own adventure storybooks, right? And so we thought it would be like really fun if we could offer sort of a choose your own adventure type of um experience and so we called it the uh choose your own lockdown adventure and so basically what this involved was producing a turtle document and creating basically lots of different variations of what could potentially happen during a day in lockdown and uh you know it starts off with you know your, your morning routine and then um you know you're kind of in a meeting and there's like different variables that can happen. One thing could be, you know, that your your partner walks in naked behind you or, you know, various different things. It was very, very funny. 
Um, and then, you know, you have like your lunchtime routine, your evening routine, where you might have, I don't know, like um, high school reunion type of thing. And you're not really sure that you actually want to join the Zoom call to like meet all these people that you don't really care about or like a family Zoom call where, you know, you're trying to make excuses as to why you're busy and can't yeah, actually join the Zoom piece. call. <laughs> and um, so it was really great. And basically how it worked was that, um, when you um when you enter this experience we have like a landing page with just a few um forms to, like fields to fill in and um, so the first thing was just like what's your first name the second thing was um you know choose your um lockdown outfit so it might be like stained pajamas it might be you know your wedding dress or you know um different different options there and then you could choose whether or not you had a pet whether it was your partner or whether um, you know it's a housemate or a child, um, and so then those would create different variations in the story, and then you could choose as you go through how you actually react to these different situations that are thrown at you. And um, so we basically sent that out through a few different uh, channels. So we sent it out through email, through a database. We did some paid promotion on LinkedIn, and we also used it for organic social. And we just had hundreds and hundreds of people engaging with this content because it was just so fun, you know, and it was like there was no agenda other than to just, you know, make people smile and, you know, just enjoy the content experience, how personalized it was. And uh, we, we saw that people were just sharing it among their peers. It resulted in quite a lot of interest, actually, for our business because um, people loved the format and people loved the fact it was so personalized and they wanted to understand how we had created this personalized piece of content, you know, specifically for them. Um, and of course, you know, as soon as people enter our content, then it allows us to be able to start retargeting them as well. So, um, you know, thus starts the nurturing that we do with these people. So it's, you know, it's a difficult one to quantify, you know, and that's why I said it depends how you define success. but. We know in terms of readership levels, they were super high, probably the, the most read piece of content that we've produced this year. And we just got tons of really great feedback from people like probably we probably never launched anything by email before where, um, you know, so many people actually felt the need to respond to the email and just say, this is absolutely brilliant. We love yeah. this. It's really made me smile. I forwarded this to my whole team. Um, so, yeah, I think that was probably our, our best piece of ungated content. That's amazing. I think that's amazing to even just come up with that idea is amazing in itself. So um, yeah, that sounds like a really great way to have captured people's, um, I guess, imaginations during lockdown, which was a hard thing to do. And also a nice way of engaging people in a difficult time, because I think there was a lot of questions around, like, is it even right to be marketing to people like when during this time and to mm. be trying to sell? And um, maybe, you know, that's a, that's a lovely example of how you can actually be softly engaging with your audience um and you're literally using the tools that you're you know that you that eventually you hope one day that's something they'll look at but you don't need to be actively trying to do that during a time which is difficult for a lot of people so i think that's yeah really for sure i mean we were constantly like deciding what is the best way to be engaging with people right now and i think like because everybody was doing stuff around covid and people were getting quite jaded by it and um, mm. we thought that yes okay obviously this is related to COVID but it's done in such a fun way that um you know people didn't mind it because it was just so different from everything else that they've been receiving so yeah it it, it definitely I think that and we did another piece um a little bit before that not not nearly as successful but it was basically um it was a COVID piece of content and it was actually um I think we called it like the seven different types of humor and um, so we looked at like different different humor types, obviously, but focused around COVID. So like taking tweets and you know different things that are, we could find on the internet that tied into those different styles of humor. And so it was like you know again just something quite lighthearted to kind of help people to just you know um, snap out of their misery for a little bit. Um, so that one worked pretty well as well. But, um, yeah, no, it, it was good and. If anybody's interested in seeing um, either of those pieces of content, feel free to ping me on LinkedIn and I can send you a link to them. Amazing. And one thing I like to ask, take the opportunity to ask when I have mar other marketing leaders on um, this series is to what sort of numbers that you 
are tracking from a marketing leader perspective um, that would force you to take action or change like what are the numbers you know that I'm talking more not the revenue figure because you know we all obviously are mm -hmm. holding to that and that's our, that is obviously the business target and as a marketing team we also are targeted on that but I mean more of the funnel metrics and the other numbers that keep you up at night and that would give you early warning signs so to speak that something's not quite right in the pipeline and will would encourage mm. you to take action kind of one way or another maybe indicate potentially the need for and I guess a piece of content arguably or or not but just yeah I'm always interested to understand kind of what those metrics look like for other leaders yeah so in terms of for me um what i guess would cause concern uh is the number of meetings that are being booked off the back of the mqls that we're generating so if we're not getting those numbers then there i mean there could be a whole bunch of reasons for why that is and i wouldn't necessarily put it down to the content that we're doing it could be because the process isn't being followed you know the leads aren't actually being actioned because um unlike um you guys at cognizant we still don't have like that streamlined process in place where you know we're getting there but you know making sure that um, mqls are followed up in a timely fashion and that you know the right messaging is being used and all of those things um so i yeah that's for me that's the thing that keeps me awake at night and i'm constantly reviewing to see how many meetings were booked this week um off the back of marketing leads and um, actually reviewing the one you know the other mqls that maybe got rejected to try and understand why they were rejected were they really rejected for the right reasons or maybe there's actually an issue here a misunderstanding or maybe just lazy follow-up in uh, uh, on occasion it could be that as well so just really keeping the SDR team honest in terms of like how they're following up on those leads um, and I think like in terms of you know I think early warning signs um, you know you can obviously very quickly see whether or not a lead has actually been updated so we have like a lead status and when it when an MQL comes in, it will have a lead status new. And if it's still sitting as new, you know, three, four days later, often much longer than that, but I won't say because it's embarrassing how long sometimes these leads sit with a new status, um, then that's a problem, you know, and we need to make sure that um, they are being followed up in a timely fashion and that we're, you know, providing the right tools in order for the um, team to be able to do that. Um, so, and I, I also spend quite a lot of time like just monitoring the the emails that go out and listening to the phone calls that our SDR team are making just to make sure that they're using the right messaging as well um but yeah for sure it could also be a sign that maybe we're not um you know producing the right content that's not delivering the right number of leads and i think that's something where you know qualitative conversations with the sales team is really important. And I have a very close relationship with our head of SDR team, just to really understand like what's going on with this team and where their priorities are. And if actually now there's a big push for sales enablement, then we need to make sure that they have enough content to support sales enablement, um, both for their outreach, but also in terms of what we're pushing to drive leads as well. So, um, but yeah, for me, it's it's 100% uh, how many meetings are booked from the leads we're generating. That's really, really interesting to know. I think for everyone, there's always that one metric that you look at and if it's going in the wrong direction, it gives you mm. those sleepless nights. We've all been there. <laughs> <laughs> um, amazing. So what is one thing that you would tell B2B marketers to start doing tomorrow they're probably not doing now? Um, ideally, this would be something that's low effort and high reward. Um, it's a question I'm asking everyone because I think mm. um, it's quite interesting to see what, how people answer that and get little different tidbits. Yeah, I mean, I have been thinking about this one and like struggling to know what to suggest, which is truly low effort, high reward, mm. um, because I do think that some of the things that make the biggest impact are gen generally do require some you know some time and energy on your part to really make it work and i guess i'm looking at this from the perspective of the challenge that i'm experiencing right now um, and what's been working for me and it actually goes back to what i was just saying around 
making sure that your MQLs are being followed up properly and don't assume that they are, you know, just because you're hitting your MQL numbers, that's not where this journey ends. You know, as marketers, we have to make sure that those leads are being followed up properly. And so I guess a quick way to do that, and this is what something that I do on a weekly basis, is I just review all of the direct MQLs that came in. So direct, I mean anyone who submitted a demo request or pricing request through our website. And I just very quickly have a look at the report and click through to all the contacts just to see have these contacts been followed up and how have they been followed up. And that probably is an exercise that takes me no more than 10 minutes. But you would be surprised how many demo requests and pricing requests aren't being followed up. I mean, it's shocking. These people are literally putting their hands up and going, hey, I'm interested in your company and your product. I'd like to buy it. And nobody is following up with them. I mean, it's terrible. So that is a quick win. Um, and, I, you know, if you're not doing it, I urge you to do it. Um, and then obviously you can go way more, more in depth with that. So for me personally, I spend like half an hour every single day with our head of the SDR team sitting down and reviewing all of the indirect MQLs. So these are generally leads that, um, that uh, become MQLs through lead nurturing and lead scoring. So once they hit a certain threshold, they then become marketing qualified leads. And we just wanna make sure that those are getting sufficient attention from his team and being followed up in a timely manner as well. And that's a lot more work because that really involves like dashboards and clicking through to like check what copy is being sent and whether things are being qualified in and out correctly. Um, but, you know, in terms of a quick win, I would suggest just, uh, you know, checking sort of those direct mm -hmm. leads and making sure that there's been some follow up. Hopefully nobody else experiences this problem that I have. But, um, you know, it's best to be sure and just take a look, I'd say. Definitely. No, it's a really good tip for sure. Um, we're very lucky. I came into a, a culture which was sort of see, sees the inbound as the gold dust. And it's just like inbuilt into the sales team. And it's so refreshing. Mm -hmm. It's definitely not the case everywhere. But um, and I do realize it's very lucky to be a part of. But um, there's a yeah, those SLAs quickly get escalated if they're not looked at. So people look mm. at them. <laughs> yeah, um, very good. I think it's really that's a really important piece for everyone to be keeping an eye on. And not, I guess, not just blind trust has to make sure mm -hmm. you're trying to that as well, which is important. Um, amazing. Well, one thing that I like to ask everyone kind of at the end of these um interviews, as we're wrapping this this up, is what um what is your favorite piece of technology within your stack right now? Um, and how do you approach buying and adopting new technology? Um, so, because I think one thing, a challenge that I'm facing right now is we're a very well tech stacked marketing team, but actually, um, or maybe too well tech stacked. So we had mm. like a, a day yesterday where we were strategizing and reviewing things. And we just realized that if we just double down focus on one piece of technology that we Bought, um, we might be able to have a significant Im impact on the conversion yeah. metrics within the funnel that could actually have much bigger impact than saying spend like two weeks planning a campaign that then doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily lift off. Um, so yeah, I'm just interested. Number one, your favorite tool that you wouldn't be without, and number two, like how do you approach buying and, and adopting new technology? Yeah, so maybe a little bit premature because I literally only bought it yesterday, but I'm so excited about it and I've been using like their trial version for a while and I love it. Um, so it's Bombora and okay. Bombora, for, for anyone who doesn't know what Bombora is, it's basically intent data. And so it shows you based on keywords that you, um, you have selected. Um, how companies are researching those keywords. So for our, from our perspective, for instance, we might be interested in people who are researching things around interactive content, content personalization, account-based marketing, whatever it might be. And, um, and then you are actually able to see specifically which companies right now are researching very, very heavily these keywords. And uh, that basically provides us with a list of people to go after. And we can use that data in so many different ways. So for instance, it's great for account selection. You know, if you're doing an account-based marketing type of thing, it's great for selecting the messaging that you might want to use when targeting them. Because you can see, okay, they're doing lots of research in these three things. 
let's make sure the emails, the advertising we're doing to those accounts is all aligned to whatever the key priorities are for those businesses. Um, and it also just allows you, like for instance, it has this really cool integration with LinkedIn. So that, um, you know, for instance, let's say we're running an ad series around account-based marketing based on our ABM guide that we have in place. And um, basically Bombora just integrates with LinkedIn. So it's constantly updating the target accounts that it's showing those ads to based on the people who are doing the most research right now on account-based marketing. I mean, it's like magic. You don't have to do anything. It's awesome and I'm like super excited about it. We've actually managed to book some meetings just using their trial data um, because we knew that people were interested in the following things and so we just called them up and hey presto meetings were booked. Um, so there's, it's, it's really cool, um, I love it. And um, going back to your um, question around how we actually approach um, buying and adopting tech, uh, I mean, I think that Obviously, it's really important that it integrates with your existing tech stack. Like, if it doesn't do that, like, don't even bother because it's just not going to get used properly. So, making sure it's, you can integrate it with your CRM is key in your your marketing automation tool. And then, if there are other things, like for instance, with Bombora, we've got it integrated with HubSpot and with LinkedIn because those are the two technologies that we will want to use that data with. Um, so that's really really key. Um, for me, I need to make sure that whatever the technology I'm bringing into play um, helps to drive efficiencies within our business. So for one of the reasons I wanted Bombora was because I wanted to make sure that if we are selecting accounts to go after from an ABM perspective, we're going after the people who are actively in market right now. Like I don't want to be wasting my time and my budget on accounts where they're not even thinking about this stuff right now because that's like an additional hurdle that you have to go after. And go over and like there are so many companies in the world that we could potentially go after like let's not worry about the ones that aren't thinking about this they're not there yet like maybe eventually they will be but like you know there's plenty of fish in the sea so um you know if it can somehow improve efficiencies within our business then like that's a big win um and i think you know where possible do try and test the technology first like prove the value within your business before you invest in it. So if you're able to, I don't know, enter a contract where there's a break clause or something like that, um, like that's really, really important just to make sure that if, you know, you're not, um, you know, seeing the benefits that you wanted to see that you're still able to pull out of it. Um, I think setting really um, strong KPIs up front in terms of what you want to achieve by introducing this technology and then measuring against that, it's really important. That's all really, really helpful. I think for me as well, especially looking at some of our content audit, um, content audit, content on the mind, our technology mm -hmm. audit right now. But I'm definitely gonna have to go and have a look at Bombora as well, because you've sold it to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, Excellent, I need to get commission. <laughs> yeah. um, well, thanks so much, Carla, for um, taking the time to uh, speak to me today. I'm conscious that we've slightly run over a bit, but I know for me, it's been really interesting to talk about this topic of dating content, you know, sometimes maybe never um, and kind of working out where where you should be and where you shouldn't be and what types of content you should and shouldn't be gating and I hope that's given people who are listening a bit of more clarity into the topic as well um, and just the, what remains for me to be said is that this is part of a series so um, if you're interested in checking out some of the other episodes that we've done but we've tried to keep them all very practical so that you will you know if you take the time to listen you should come away with some clear takeaways from them um, and we have been interviewing people who are sort of tearing up the marketing playbook and trying to do something a bit different to the normal. So go over to Mailtastic and check it out on LinkedIn and that will be where you can keep up with the latest there. But thanks again very much, Carla. And um, oh, my pleasure. really, really appreciate your time. And thanks everyone for listening. Yeah, thanks a lot. Bye.